Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron here. We have been looking at different things about the historical perfectibilis, the Illuminati, and trying to discern fact from fiction. It shocks me, you know, I still teach at Indiana Bible College, how it's almost ubiquitous in knowledge. Like every young person now knows who the Illuminati is, but they've got all kinds of weird stuff. So we're looking at the original May 1st, 1776, excuse me, Adam Weishaupt, What is Fact from Fiction? So I'm using my Terry Melanson book, which I consider to be the best book out besides um, the original writings of Adam Weishaupt and the Illuminati on this subject because he is a Canadian historian, researcher, absolutely fantastic. I've read this book through a couple, three times, just because, you know, when I, I got into Bible prophecy back in the 90s, and when you get into Bible prophecy, I was reading like Pat Robertson's New World Order. I mean, this was a New York Times bestseller. His dad was a U.S. Senator, and he's got a whole thing on the Illuminati. I was like, wow, they did exist. And now it's like, yeah, they did exist. And probably the fire in the minds of men, their thinking processes have animated revolutionary movements since then. But of course, as Christians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So we, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and thoughts and imaginations that exalt itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I just do this to separate fact from fiction. So we, we went through a part one where we did kind of a brief history of the Illuminati, and I'm getting it from this book. I may do some ad-libbing in here, too. So, in 1784, Joseph Maines Franz von Bebo publishes two works anonymously, which represent the first public denunciation against the order. The first was Table of the Life of Men, and then on Freemasonry, particularly in Bavaria, initial warning. So remember, a lot of times that the Illuminati were called the Bavarian Illuminati. Some people say, well, that's where Hitler started, and they make some connection there. Not sure that there's a connection there. I would say, even though he was a national socialist, I would say that the Illuminati had more in common with communism than it did with Nazism. And even May 1st is this international communist holiday. And I would think that goes back to Adam Weishaupt, even the term May Day, you know, the Illuminati, all of this. Okay, so April 20th, Baron von Nigg resigns from the Illuminati. This is still 1784. Now, um, I've got a book floating around here I read maybe a couple times from Baron Von Nigg where he wrote to Adam Weishaupt. Um, Baron Von Nigg, he was responsible for bringing in hundreds of initiates into the Illuminati at the Wilhelmsbad Masonic Conference in like 1781, but he could not stand Weishaupt despotic methods and the horrible things that Weishaupt, you know, he considered him just like some dictator. And so Baron von Nigg, he's got some popular books still in Germany on manners or something like that. But I mean, it's just historical fact. He used to be in the Illuminati. Okay, after his quarrels with Weiss hopped over the direction and management of the order reach a boiling point, a certain amount of jealousy was apparent from both parties, though Weiss Hop was certainly a Machiavellian by all accounts. Nig, complaining to Zach, decried Weiss Hop's Jesuitism more than anything. The scheming, despotism, even dictatorship of the latter, especially toward his subordinates. In the spirit of those much maligned sons of Laota, Spartacus writes Nick. Now, remember, they all had pseudonyms. They had like a Persian calendar, pseudonyms. So, like Adam Weishaupt's pseudonym was Spartacus. That's the reason when Winston Churchill wrote about him in 1920, he wrote about Spartacus Weishaupt. And uh, they've even now got the Russians by the hair of the head, you know, is even a latent Jesuit. Now, they hated the Jesuits. A lot of people try to say that Weishaupt was a Jesuit, but everything historical that I can find, and I know there's deception in there and all this, that he actually hated the Jesuits. He despised the Jesuit. And I am the own cast down. God, what a man. 
Where does his unrestrained passion lead? Had I ever believed this man capable of such low and ungrateful behavior? And it was under his banner that I was to work for mankind. That is to say, under the yoke of such a pig-headed man, never again. So this is Von Nigg's opinion of Weishaupt. You know, Thomas Jefferson talked about Weishaupt. Uh, George Washington and John Adams. Uh, talked about multiple times in Washington's case about the order of the Illuminati. Okay, in the 1798 presidential election or 1800, I forget which one, it was big on that. There's a book I've read maybe at least once, maybe twice, on the Bavarian Illuminati. It's written in like 1916. And uh, it was all about the election because you had Jedediah Morse, you had uh, Timothy Dwight, Jonathan Edwards' grandson, all preaching against the Illuminati. All right, Seth Payson, 1802. Okay, so June 22nd, the Elector of Bavaria, Duke Carl Theodore, issues an edict against society, secret or otherwise, not authorized by the law or the sovereign, published the next day. It read in part. So this is. Carl Theodore in 1785, four, excuse me, his first broadside, kind of generally against the Illuminati. And because they had hundreds of people in academia, in various political offices, in bureaucracies, it's pretty amazing. I think even the taxi family, which would have been kind of like the postmasters of Europe, which was extraordinarily wealthy. I was just reading the other day, you know, in, in like Yahoo News or something, there was something about the taxi family. I was like, wow. Okay. Whereas all communities, societies, and associations without approval from public authority and the confirmation of the monarch are illegal, prohibited by law, suspect, and dangerous things in themselves. And I'm going to skip over some things. It says, these societies have drawn the attention of the public and awakened its fears. And he's actually, I love Melanson because he's actually got a copy of this edict here in this particular book. He's got, you know, a copy of it. So that's pretty fascinating. So, uh, you know, remember back in 2004, you had John Kerry, Skull and Bones, running for president with George uh, Bush, Skull and Bones. George Bush's dad was Skull and Bones. You know, and so you know, secret societies really got kind of in the news then about uh, that type of thing. And now with so many celebrities talking about the Illuminati, it's really big. Okay, so July 1st, 1784, Baron von Nigg signs a formal agreement to return all property, rituals, and initiations belonging to the order and to maintain silence about Illuminati secrets. Because remember, they, their first thing was, is we want to perfect man, we want the benefit of man. And so that was very altruistic, very good. But the more concentric circles you got into, as C.S. Lewis wrote about in that hideous strength, he was writing, it's very clear to me about the Illuminati and maybe the Mason and things, and when I say the Masons, not your average nice Mason, Christian Mason, and all this, but people in certain initiates and that type of thing, that um, um, that this was how the world worked. It was pretty fascinating. Okay, so largely because of Nig's circle of influence, and according to the Librarian of Congress, the term circular actually came because the Illuminati's deal was a circle and a dot, you know. I always remember that the YouTube channel, this is not like an independent standalone video. We have a YouTube channel with thousands of videos for research for you to go back. Just hit the New Life of Albany button and it'll tell you how to access playlists and everything else. All right. So the Illuminati now have between two and three thousand members. So, and they weren't just getting like average people. They were getting people in religion. They were getting all kinds of people. Okay, historian Rene Leforestier, who, is, who was the authority, but see his stuff wasn't in English, it was in French, wrote an articulate summary of the situation of the order found itself in during the heyday in 1784. So let's listen to this. This is amazing. 
solidly established in Bavaria, this is talking about the Illuminati, extends all throughout Central Europe, from the Rhine to the Vistula and the Alps to the North Sea and the Baltic. It includes among its members young men who will later apply the principles with which they've been inculcated, civil servants of every kind who use their influence in the service of the order, members of the clergy who they teach tolerance, and princes whom they hope to lead and call upon for protection. Which remember, Weishaupt, when everything went down, he went to the elector of Saxe Gotha, who later became the family of Queen Victoria in England. That's kind of interesting. Okay. It seems as if the great architect of the universe himself watches over them. Year after year since its founding, its conquests continually multiply. Its leader, just when he was beginning to think the order was sink under its own weight, and that was about 1778-1779, found a clever and active collaborator in Nig, just as good with pen and hand, composing the higher grades of the order as he was skillful and persuasive propaganda. So reading about the order, like... Uh, in Abbe Bariel's book, that's fascinating. Maybe some in Robinson's book, both from 1798. They talk about the uh, or the uh, initiation and just the intense study of human mankind. It was it was a social credit system well before now, you know, so to speak. Um, Strict observance, the main obstacle to its ambitious plans, has crumbled, leaving the road free. And it's talking about strict observance freemasonry so they basically had taken over in a sense grand orient freemasonry and we know the jacobins from whom the french revolution socialism communism came from uh met at the jacobin lodges you know so that the grand orient in france so jjc bode who was the leader of the illuminati after adam weishaupt went to france and that's the reason so many people think the french revolution was either Illuminati led or the principles of it Illuminati led because I mean like they just lied about Marie Antoinette and uh, you know the uh, what was it the golden necklace affair the diamond necklace affair it was just the power of the press the power of the pen of uh, something that never happened and then the let them eat cake never happened and yeah you still hear that today leaving the road free and the two greatest leaders of that particular system of Freemasonry were able to be token up, taken up by the order. So the strict observance had been taken over. All right. Uh, a far cry from the days when Weishaupt had gathered together in his house with a few obscure students. Um, now, November 14th, 1784, the Golden and Rosy Cross printed a manifesto against the Illuminati, the Rosicrucians. And so they seem to be at uh, war, the Rosicrucians versus uh, the Illuminati. I was thinking about Rose, Rosencruz or whatever their name is. Okay, so 1785, whoever was head of the Rosicrucians in theory, Hermes Trismetris or who which I was uh, glad to hear of a uh, evangelical philosopher and theologian mention Hermes Trismegistus. I thought that was phenomenal. Okay, the Golden and Rosy Cross. Okay, so 1785 February, in an effort to prove their innocence, some members of the Illuminati appeal to Carr Theodore for an appearance. The offer is rejected. Weishaupt is dismissed from his post at Ingolstadt. Remember, he taught canon law that had been taught by uh, Jesuits before that because of his uh, kind of adopted father, stepfather's influence there at the college. He got that. Ostensibly on the grounds of trying to procure ungodly books huh, in literature for the university's library, such as Pierre Bale's Dictionary, His Historical and Critical Dictionary, 1697-1702, and the writings of Richard Simon, who's worked for Critical of the Old New Testament. So now that is absolutely fascinating right there, because you here you have critical theory and textual criticism. Richard Simon was a Catholic priest who was the first to question, like Deuteronomy 34, he and Barack Spinoza, but he's considered to be the father of textual criticism. And here Adam Weishaupt's trying to get his books. 
because he knows it will destroy the Bible because he always knew his main enemy was Christianity. He worshiped the God of reason. All right. So that is unbelievable right there. Okay, March 2nd, Carl Theodore issues the second edict against secret societies, specifically naming the Illuminati and Freemasonry. Shortly after a considerable number of the order's important archives and documents were concealed or destroyed or put into flames. The second ban was more forceful, leaving no room for evasion. The government enforcers were given weapons to wage an effective campaigns and it says we call theodore by the grace of god goes on and on and so forth um skip a lot of stuff we declare that all money and any funds collected illegally by the lotches shall be confiscated half will be given to the poor while the other half will go to the denunciator even if he's a member of one of these societies with a promise to keep his name confidential now that's pretty uh pretty good incentive to say if you will rat on the Illuminati will give you half the goods that are found in their possession the other half will go to the poor so Weishaupt has been uh, canned because he's trying to get Bale's book he's trying to get Richard Simon's books on textual criticism think about that church Weishaupt had left Ingolstadt two weeks earlier obviously knowing about the approaching storm. He had fled across the border to Regensburg and finally settled at Gotha under the protector of the Illuminati member Duke Ernest II of Saxe Gotha Altenburg. Always remember that family is where the monarchs of England come from. Thirteen years later, Bariel writes, Weishaupt now banished from his country as a traitor to his prince and the whole universe, peaceably at the court, Ernest Lewis, Duke of Saxe-Gotha, enjoys an asylum, receives a pension from the public treasury, and is dignified with the title of honorary counselor to the prince, that prince, and lived till, till 1831. 1831, okay? Uh, the details of Weishaupt's escape were actually full of suspense and intrigue. This is 1785. As he tried to leave Ingolstadt, he realized that guards were posted throughout the city with orders for his arrest. Weishaupt hid in the house of master locksmith and fellow illuminist Joseph Martin and managed to escape a few days later by disguising, disguising himself in the clothes of a work working craftsman. Having successfully fled the city, Weishaupt stayed shortly in Nuremberg and then went to the free imperial city of Regensburg by the middle of April, where he was visited by Duke Ernest II. And that's where he began his rich literary activities. And we've gone over his books, um, the books that he actually wrote. So you may want to look at that video. Um, so April, the natural National Superior for Germany, Count Zu Stolberg Rocius, sent out a circular, presumably to the lodges of his district, which stated, You are released from all duties, excepting only secrecy, which you have accepted from entering our order. Um, so that is pretty amazing. Because he says, Whatever duties you had in the Illuminati, you're released. We are not speaking of an official dissolution here, as some historians are quick to call it. It is patently absurd to state such a thing and incredibly misleading. Zealous members such as Frederick Munter, J.J.C. Bode, and Carl Ann Reinhold, apparently, they didn't get the memo. Would continue the activities of the Illuminati, recruiting vigorously a stellar assortment of initiates. And, and as Illuminati expert Monica Nugabauer Wolk has pointed out, order branches were still functioning in 1788. So, this high government official, who evidently was an Illuminist, said, Look, disband, but still be in the Illuminati, but you don't have to do your works. The only thing that can be definitively stated is that he delivered a prefecture reports and protocols ceased in 1787-88 without any formal decree of dissolution being documented. April 3rd, we come to Cassandi, and he's considered one of the heroes of history if people that are in the Illuminati studies. Okay. Illuminati defector Johann Suplicitus Marcus de Cassandi grants his juridical deposition concerning his knowledge of the Illuminati. One of the most startling doctors, 
Exodus revealed was that which recommended suicide, even elevating it as a virtue. According to Cassandi, an Illumine, they would tell us, should make a way with himself rather than betray his order. And they also represent a, a secret voluptuousness to be inherent to suicide. April 7th, Illuminati defector Vitus Renner gives his judicial deposition on the Illuminati. He uh, discloses one of the maxims of the order, which I don't know what this translates as. Tuas le roi et tuas le prêtres sont des frépons et des traitors. I don't know what that means. And so they're saying you can commit suicide for the order, and it's actually a good thing. Yet another revealing piece of information supplied by Renner is his, the account he gives of the moral regime of the order. It's moral government on, or commission of morals or it's fiscal. Um, this commission is a college formed of the most able and honest men, that is, in their language, of men chiefly belonging to the class of invisibles who, enjoying the confidence of the sovereign, would, according to the views of their commission, inform the morals and honesty of each of the subjects. But as probity is necessary to fulfill the diverse stations of the state, each person should be prepared beforehand for the office he's to occupy. Okay, skipping some things. Uh, uh, all posts once properly filled in succession with each other should be should the order be composed of but 600 members no power on earth could resist them so he's saying that they had such probity or scrupulousness with each other if there were just 600 people alive on earth they could take over the world if they were hooked together the way he uh, says this and this is Renner and so we're going to stop there in this exciting history of the Illuminati the real thing not what you hear about all the time talk with you later God bless let's live for Jesus